the reason why we're here, um, and Jim Rogers, etc., as well, is to show you that in these changing times, you need a changing strategy. So what we'd like to do is just highlight some of the issues, talk about where we are you know, geopolitically, talk about where we are financially, and the global economy. So without any further ado, I'm really going to just introduce Jim Rogers now, um, who I have great pleasure in doing so, and I thank you very much for his time, and I'm sure you'll give him a, a big welcome. Thank you, Jim. Over to you. Well, thank you, Anthony. I'm, I'm delighted to be here. I certainly uh, agree with most of the things in that, in that little video, because unfortunately for all of us, that is what's happening in the world today, whether we like it or not, and we have to face reality. You cannot invest or you cannot survive on what you hope will happen. You have to survive on what is happening, you know, what the real situation is. Um, before we start, I would just tell you all, one of the way, reasons I have come to this conclusion is that I've spent a couple of years, a couple of trips going around the world, as some of you know. A few years ago, my then fiance, she's now my wife, Paige Parker, and I spent three years driving around the world. We drove through 116 countries. We drove 245,000 kilometers. And as you can see, we got into the Guinness Book of World Records. Well, I'm the first hedge fund manager to drive around the world. So I hope that all of you are going to make so much money with liquid assets, uh, liquid investments, that you two are going to get yourself a new spouse or take the old spouse, nothing wrong with the old spouse, take a spouse and head off around the world. So this time I'm going to teach you, uh, talk to you about some of the things I've learned and what I'm doing uh, with my life and my investments uh, as a result. The first thing we all have to understand uh, is the rise of China. China's certainly getting more and more pressed these days than it used to. People know something's going on in China. Most people are not fully aware of the historic significance of what's happening in China, in fact, including most Chinese. China is going to be the next great country in the world, whether we like it or not. Certainly a lot of people who do not like the fact that China is on the rise again, but unfortunately there's not much we can do about it because it's happening. You know, the 19th century was the century of the UK, the 20th century was the century of the US, well the 21st century is going to be the century of China. Uh, when I speak to most people, I tell them the very best advice I can give them is to teach their children and grandchildren Chinese. My, I showed you my little girls. Both of my little girls speak fluent Mandarin. Uh, seven or eight years ago, we sold our house in New York and we moved to Asia because I want my girls to grow up speaking Mandarin and knowing Asia. So in my view, it's the best skill that I can give two children born in the early 21st century. So again, I'm not just talking about it, I'm doing it, uh, acting it out, and hopefully I'm giving them the right preparation. They still call themselves communists in China, but I assure you they are, they are among the best capitalists in the world. I know people who would tell you they are the best capitalists in the world as we speak here in 2014. Uh, you know, the Chinese, uh, China is the only country I know of in world history that's had recurring periods of greatness. Great Britain was great once. Egypt was great once. Rome was great once. China has been spectacularly successful three or four times in their history. They've also collapsed three or four times in their history, had total catastrophe, and been ruined. But somehow or another, every time they have done that, they have turned around over the next few hundred years and come back to great heights. Uh, China was in serious decline for three or four hundred years. Uh, Mao Zedong really ruined China in the end. And then in 1978, Deng Xiaoping said, the new leader said, we got to do something new. This is not working. He turned China around. He opened it to the outside world. He opened, a, a, a re revived capitalism. And as some of you all know, it has been the most successful country in the world in the past 30 years. Well, that's not a fluke as far as I can see. It's going to go on for a long time. It is already changing the world that we have known, and it's going to continue to change the world. Do not get me wrong. There will certainly be setbacks along the way. Every country, every company, every family, every, every individual 
has setbacks as they rise, <coughs> nothing goes straight up. So China will certainly have problems along the way. I don't know what or when or why or how, but they certainly will. I would remind you that America was the most successful country in the 20th century. But as we were rising, we had horrible civil war, 15 depressions, very few human rights, little rule of law, massacres in the streets. You know, you could buy and sell congressmen. Well, you still buy and sell congressmen, but they were a lot cheaper, you know, in the old days than, than they are now. So, so we had many problems, many problems. In, two, in 1907, the whole thing collapsed. We were, went bankrupt. Washington, New York, the whole thing totally collapsed. But we still became the most extraordinary country in the 20th century. That's the sort of thing that China will have to face, but it, they're on the rise. So my children speak Mandarin. In fact, just to be a proud parent for a moment, the, the first one I showed you, she's 11 now, uh, recently won the nationwide Mandarin speaking contest in Singapore. If I went to a movie and a blue-eyed blonde was the best Mandarin speaker in a Chinese country, I'd walk out. I'd say, who the hell are they kidding? This is absurd. But she won it. I mean, we were extraordinarily proud. We were more shocked than proud at first. It's not only did she win it, she won it last year, she won it this year too. So it can be done, and we are living how I see the 21st century. China is on the rise. There will be problems, but if you look at that map, you will see it's affecting all of Asia. Now, there are 3 billion, 3 billion people in Asia. That's billion with a B. And most of those people have been living pretty low levels of uh, lifestyle for the past 100 years or so. But now they're all becoming more prosperous. Uh, when I first went to China 30 years ago, you know how we would meet each other on the street and we'd say, hello, how are you? The Chinese would say, hello, have you eaten today? That was the common way to greet people. That was only 30 years ago. Well, now they're eating. They're eating every day. In those days, if you had chicken, you maybe had it once a year or once a lifetime. Now they're eating chicken, pork, beef, even. Their, their lifestyle is changing, but that's true of everybody in Asia. I want to remind you there are three billion people. They're all living a different lifestyle. You know, I first went to China. Everybody wore the same clothes. Now, oh my God, you walk down the streets of any Chinese city, and it's astonishing how fashionable and stylish they all are. They all have lots of clothes in their wardrobes. There are clothing shops everywhere. In, my, in the first time I went, there were very few clothing shops. So agriculture and all things that people consume, we in the West consume, they want to live the same way, and it's happening as, as we speak. There are a couple of other things we need to discuss that are changing as well. But I just also want to say that if you look at that map, you know, in the 1920s and 1930s, the center of the world moved from the UK to the US. It was exacerbated by a financial crisis and mistakes made by politicians. Well, the same thing is happening now. The center of the world is moving from the US to Asia, exacerbated by a financial crisis and mistakes made by politicians. Uh, unfortunately, we are having to bear the brunt of all of that, but the largest creditor nations in the world now are China, Korea, Japan, Singapore, Hong Kong, uh, Taiwan. The assets are in Asia now. The growth is in Asia. The population is in Asia. It's all happening there. If you look at that map and you, will, you can see, well, you can't see on that map, but the United States is now the largest debtor nation in the history of the world. Not just the largest debtor nation in the world, it's the largest debtor nation in the whole history of the world. No nation has ever gotten itself so deep in debt as we have in the United States. And as you all know, especially those of you who are Americans, you know that the debt is going higher and higher every day. And those clowns in Washington are really not doing anything about it except spending more and more and borrowing more and more. No nation in world history that's ever gotten itself into this situation has gotten out without a crisis or a semi-crisis. I mean, it's simple facts. This is not, not an opinion or something. You can easily look this up if you don't already know it. You can look at that map and you look at Europe and you see lots of other huge debtor nations. Well, 
I mean, they're all doing the same thing. They're all talking austerity. All the politicians in Europe are talking a good game, but there's not a single country on that map that's going to have lower debt this year than last year, or that will have lower debt next year than this year. They're all talking about saving themselves and saving their countries, but nobody's doing anything. The situation is getting worse and worse and worse. Which leads me to currencies. Uh, the US dollar is and has been the world's reserve currency for maybe 60, 70 years now. It took over from the pound sterling, which was the world's reserve currency itself for 160 or 70 years. Uh, and unfortunately, the US dollar, and I'm an American citizen, uh, the US dollar is a terribly flawed currency. Uh, I told you we're the largest debtor nation in the world, and the debt's going higher and higher. Countries that get themselves in this kind of situation, they ultimately have serious problems with their currencies, and something comes along to replace it, just as the US dollar replaced the pound sterling once upon a time. Now, at the moment, I own US dollars, even though I, I know it's a flawed currency and there's a dire future for the, for the dollar. The reason I own it at the moment is because there's going to be a lot of currency turmoil. There already is currency turmoil starting. There's going to be more currency turmoil in the next three or four years. And rightly or wrongly, when people are scared and panicked, instinctively, they, go to, they run to the US dollar. They think that it's a safe haven. It is not a safe haven, but it's perceived as a safe haven at the moment. Therefore, I own US dollars. If I get it right, you know, the US dollar will go up during this, this turmoil, uh, and, for, and I'll be smart enough to sell. I hope. I hope I'll be smart enough to sell my US dollars. What will I do then? I don't know. It's going to be a serious problem. It is. But at the moment, I own more US dollars than I do any other currency in the world because I see more problems coming, and people will seek it as a safe place to put money. So we, we have problems facing us. Uh, as I said, the US dollar is the world's reserve currency, but it's based on the nation which is the largest debtor nation in world history, and it's getting worse and worse. So one of the things that I see happening in the world is that I, anyway, am optimistic about agriculture for a variety of reasons. And one of the reasons is that the world has consumed over the past decade more than it has produced. And when you consume more than you produce, you've got to run down your inventories. So inventories, stocks of most agricultural products are near <coughs> historic lows. This year we're having a good crop and there's a lot of uh, pro uh, produce uh, uh, stocks hitting the market driving prices down, uh, but it's not really adding much to the inventories because we continue to consume so much worldwide. Uh, those three billion people I showed you in Asia like eating, they like dressing, they like changing their styles as often as they can. So the world is facing a serious problem. It's not just the fact that the inventories have been run down, by the way. Agriculture has been a horrible business for 30 years Therefore, we are running out of farmers. The average age of farmers in America is 58. In Japan, it's 66. In Australia, it's 58. In Canada, it's the oldest in recorded history. This, we're running out of, I mean, farmers are getting old. All of you are reasonably well educated. I suspect that nobody you went to school with became a farmer, maybe one or two, but for the most part, Nobody wants to be a farmer. In America, more people study public relations than study agriculture. We have in India uh, millions of farmers committing suicide over the past 15 or 20 years. The highest rate of suicide in the UK is in agriculture. It has been a terrible place to be, and therefore we've got a serious crisis facing us in the future. We just don't have enough farmers. Now, either the price of food is going to go up a lot, or we're not going to have any food at any price. Something's going to happen to attract young people to agriculture, or it's not going to be any food. Now, we've had these huge cycles throughout world history. We're having them again. 
uh, someday you're going to see the farmers driving Lamborghinis and the stockbrokers driving taxis. The smart stockbrokers will learn to drive tractors so that they can work for the smart farmers because the farmers are going to have the money and that's what will attract more capital, more labor, more management into agriculture uh, in, order to, in order for to feed us all and for the world to survive. Uh, so I'm extremely optimistic about agriculture as we sit here in 2014, for the next decade or two. I mean, I live in Singapore, which some of you know is a small island uh, country. Uh, there's not much room for farming in Singapore. I'd be teaching my children to drive tractors as well right now. But Singapore is not a country with a great agricultural future. And since I want them to learn Mandarin, I don't, I haven't quite reconciled how to teach these girls about farming going forward. But my first priority is uh, Mandarin. My second priority would be agriculture. And I haven't sorted that out yet. You may ask why I don't live in China, because China <clears throat> once upon a time was a great agricultural nation. The main reason is because China is so filthy and so polluted. I just, I just, we, we tried. We went and looked, scouted it out, many Chinese places to live, but uh, China is really filthy. That's an opportunity, by the way, as an aside, because the government is now spending staggering amounts of money trying to clean up China because they too know that it's a filthy situation. So somebody's going to make a lot of money cleaning up China. And by the way, one of the other things that the Chinese government has done recently is they have started giving great incentives for agriculture in China because they know that they have a problem. Uh, they don't say it out loud, but Mao Zedong ruined Chinese, totally ruined Chinese agriculture. Uh, they certainly don't say that out loud, but they know they have an agricultural problem. So they are starting to give great incentives to agriculture in China. But back to the situation, I just want to show you, I think I can show you one slide here to show you how dire agriculture has been. Uh, let's see, that's it. I started uh, back in 1998 some uh, commodity indices. Uh, the green one is agriculture. Uh, the, the blue one, for those of you who cannot see, is the S&P 500 stocks in the U.S. The red one is bonds, what's happened to bonds in that period of time. But the green one is what's happened to agriculture since 1998. And as you can see, the index today is below where it was in 1998, 16 years ago. So you can see agriculture has really been a terrible place to be, uh, which is why we're running out of farmers and why something has to change pretty dramatically. Can you go back to the map, please? Ah, thank you. No, the map, the map. Uh, something has to happen dramatically in agriculture. Uh, Brazil has been historically a great agricultural producing nation. I presume it will be in the future. They certainly have the, the land, they have the weather. You can see where it is on the map. So Brazil, we presume, will continue to be a great agricultural nation. So I think what I'm going to do now is I'm going to stop and take questions. I can talk about a lot of stuff, but I think our time would be better spent talking about what you want to talk about. But you can ask me questions about anything you want. You can talk about honeymoon spots. Uh, <laughs> I've been to some good ones, some bad ones. The best beer in the world. I've had some good beer, bad. Talk about making money, losing money. I've certainly lost plenty of money in my life. So we can talk about anything you guys want to. Yes, Catalina. Wait, I'm sorry? Just a second. Do we have a microphone by any chance? It's coming. Ah. Um, and, and by the way, please say your name and where you're from before you speak. Okay. Um, you're a great believer on the Asian market, but some... Oh, no, what's some... your name? Tell them your name. I know your name. Katerina. I'm Katerina. I'm contracts manager. Um, but you, you've been somewhat skeptical about India. What about South America? I've been very skeptical about India and continue to be uh, skeptical about India. Uh, Latin America, well, Latin America his, historically <coughs> should be a <coughs> land of great opportunity. You can see the map as well as I can. All of those countries in Latin America have huge natural resources, weather, 
population, etc. Uh, unfortunately, most of them have been badly managed for the most part in the past couple of hundred years. I'm not sure why they've been so badly managed. Uh, you, know, you look at Venezuela, I mean, no country in the world has better opportunity than Venezuela, and they keep messing it up over and over again. Argentina the same way, 100, 125 years ago, and people in Europe, when they were deciding to immigrate, they were just, they, the choice was either the US or Argentina. Many of them went to Argentina 100 years ago because it was the land of the future, as, as was America. Many came to America, uh, the United States as well. Uh, Argentina has gone straight to hell since uh, 100, 125 years ago. So many of these Latin American countries have great opportunities, uh, great uh, assets. Unfortunately, they have not run them very well for most of the time. Now, that usually leads to opportunities because when there's a disaster, if nothing else, things are going to get better for a while. If the Chinese have a, a term, which you all may know, it's yin and yang, and it means that whenever there's a disaster, there's an opportunity. So whenever there's a disaster, such as Venezuela right now, there's probably an opportunity. Argentina, not yet. But uh, many of these countries, unfortunately, Katarina, have been <coughs> badly managed for a long time. They still exist. Uh, and people have made great fortunes in those countries during the disasters, but it has not been straight up by any stretch of the imagination. I had rather, well, I told you my children speak Mandarin. The little one is learning Spanish as well as Mandarin, but her main focus is Mandarin. She also speaks, if she were here, she could speak some Spanish for you. So if you don't want to learn Mandarin, learn Spanish or Portuguese. Yes. Uh, speaking of Portuguese. Actually, and building on Katrina's uh, uh, comments, uh, uh, we know that this, uh, there's been a huge flow of immigra immigration from uh, rural areas to urban areas, and it's been over there in, in Asia uh, and also um, in Africa. And uh, can you share your thoughts about, uh, about Africa subcontinent, or Africa continent, actually? Well, I'm also optimistic about parts of Africa. Um, it's, it's a generalization because there are over 50 countries in Africa. But if there were six of me, uh, speaking of Portuguese, one of me would be in Angola right now. I'm going to Angola next month, uh, coincidentally. But I'm very optimistic about some countries in Africa. Angola, Tanzania, Ethiopia. There are places where there are spectacular opportunities. Zimbabwe, if uh, Mr. Mugabe ever dies, it doesn't look like he's ever going to die, but if he does, <laughs> there'll be uh, opportunities in Zimbabwe. Uh, so, you know, there's some wonderful places in, in Africa that have great opportunities. Unfortunately, they too have been very badly managed, which uh, I can't think of a single well-managed African country that's been consistently well-managed. Ghana, maybe? Ghana, maybe. I, I own shares in Ghana, uh, yeah. but, but Ghana's had many periods of, and I just bought some last week, uh, Ghana's had many periods of uh, disaster. Uh, it has been less badly run mm -hmm. than some of yeah, the others, sure. but when I think of countries to invest around the world, Ghana's not the first thing that pops to mind. I did buy shares there last week, as I said, but I assure you, much more of my effort is in, uh, in Asia. In Asia. Uh, than, in, than in Ghana or, or Africa. But it's a fa fabulous, I mean, listen, if any of you don't have something better to do, go and spend some time traveling around Africa. Africa is a sort of place that you either love or hate. I knew a very elegant, fancy American woman. She flew to Kenya with her, uh, her boyfriend, her husband, and uh, she hated it so much she never left the airport. <laughs> Just went over and got on a plane and left and went home. Now, I happen to love Africa. When I went to Africa, I couldn't get enough of it. It's, as I say, it's the kind of place where you either love it or you hate it. And you, uh, if you do love it, there are great opportunities there. I think you have to know how to adapt. Well, you have to know how to adapt anywhere in the world, anywhere in life, and whether it's Park Avenue or darkest Africa. Uh, yes, I adore Africa. I'm very keen on Africa. I'm very keen on Brazil, too. For that matter, uh, Brazil is a place that 
I've been, I first came to Brazil 40 years ago, and uh, it was a mess 40 years ago, but uh, boy, I've never had a bad time in Brazil. Jim. And by the way, for those of you, I, I showed a short bit of uh, Iguazu Falls. If you have time while you're here, you ought to try to go over to Iguazu Falls because it is one of the ext world's extraordinary uh, sites to, to visit. I would say Iguazu Falls is probably the most extraordinary set of waterfalls in the world. And if you have a chance, you should go, go and take a look. Jim, uh, in your opinion, what would need to happen? Sorry, what did you oh, mean? sorry, yeah. Uh, Jesus Mantas, I uh, manage Jesus, Jesus. Mantas. Yes. I manage uh, IBM Global Businesses in Latin America. Oh. And my question is, um, uh, you, you kind of brushed on the US dollar. Uh, the question is, what would it take, what would have to happen for the US dollar to lose the status of uh, you know, world reserve currency and which commodity assets would benefit from that? Well, uh, Jesus, uh, what will have to happen is more of what it is happening now. The debt is going higher and higher uh, in the US. Uh, people are already starting to move away from the US dollar, especially our enemies. Uh, the Iranians don't use US dollars anymore, the Venezuelans and other countries. Uh, but even our friends are starting to say, wait a minute, this is these guys are out of control, and the Koreans are, who have 40,000 troops occupying them, so they don't have too much choice. But even the Koreans are starting to say, wait a minute, this is, this is, this is not going to work. So people are looking for alternatives. Recently, the Chinese and the Russians uh, have started setting up a competitor to the World Bank and to the IMF, uh, and, the, and the, they're looking for something to use besides US dollars in trade and in their reserves. 10 or 15 years ago, the US dollar, uh, seven, world reserves were 70% US dollars. Now it's 62% because people are moving more and more away from the US dollar. <coughs> Nothing has to happen. It's the same old thing. But eventually, people, more and more people are going to move away, just as happened with the pound sterling. I mean, the UK is still there. Sterling still exists, but nobody uses it in their trade anymore, except unless they're trading with the UK. People just moved away, and the and pound sterling from the top went down 80% against the US dollar. So that's what will happen to the US dollar as we go forward. Now, it could be more dire. We could lose a war. We could, all sorts of strange things could happen. Uh, but nothing has to happen specifically except what's already happening. And you might then say, well, can the situation be saved? Yeah, but what it would take to save the situation in the US would be so dramatic. Uh, I, I would love to see something dramatic happen and save it, but we would have to have a whole new set of politicians, a whole new set of educators, a whole new set of everything. And that's not going to happen, unfortunately. I'd like for it to happen, but it's not. And, and in, in that scenario, so, when it happens, which may be a step function or it may be gradual, what, well, what will happen to what asset classes? Well, the way to protect yourself throughout history has been to own real assets, uh, things that come out the other side with value. Uh, farmland, for instance, has been the classic uh, way to save yourself when, when currencies collapse when things go to hell. Uh, other real assets as well, but agriculture, agricultural land, agricultural products has been the prime way to save yourself because first thing people do is eat, whether we like it or not. Uh, so protecting yourself that way. Gold sometimes has been great, silver sometimes has been great, uh, but, the, but the main thing universally throughout history has been agriculture and agricultural products and farmland, agricultural land. But be sure you own land where it rains. If it doesn't rain on your farmland, you're going to suffer like everybody else. Right. So it's got to be good farmland. Who else has a question? Yes, sir. Walt DeLang from Canada. And talking about farmers, I actually have been farming all my life.
Oh, smart man. Be nice to him. Where's your well, farm? Well, that, uh, I, right now I don't have a crop farmland. I just work in maple syrup. I, my health kind of forced me to sell the farm in order to have money to live on. And, uh, but what would happen if they develop Ukraine, what used to be the breadbasket of Europe, some of the other, uh, India has fairly good, fairly good farmland, if they would develop it, would like somebody actually smart enough to say, hey, we, got, we, can, get, we can raise good crops here. Brazil could raise tremendous crops, I think, if they have a bit better transportation system. Um, what would happen if they go there? Would farming still be an, a, a positive uh, investment? Well, you're exactly right. No, Ukraine used to be one of the great agricultural nations of the world, India. India used to be astonishing. They've got great weather, great food, I mean, great uh, land. They've got everything in India. Uh, unfortunately, both of those countries, India and Ukraine, have been extraordinarily badly managed for a long time. In India, for instance, the government, there's no infrastructure in India, there's no infrastructure in Ukraine. In India, it's the law that to protect the farms, that no farmer can own more than five hectares, 12 acres. Now, how do you think that an Indian farmer with 12 acres is going to compete with a Canadian farmer who's going to have 12,000 acres, or an Australian farmer, or farmers in other parts of the world? You now, many of these countries have been hopelessly mad. I mean, in Africa, you don't have to farm. You can just sit beside the road and things will grow. It's, it's, that, uh, it's that fertile and the weather's that good. Unfortunately, all of these places have been horribly managed, and therefore, agriculture is, has suffered. That does not mean there could not be great opportunities. There could be. Could be someday. But someday is a long way away. And in the meantime, someday is not coming. Uh, yeah, yeah, I would love to go to Africa and be a farmer. But unfortunately, I'd probably go broke. Because I'm just not, first of all, I wouldn't be a good farmer. And second of all, you'd have to fight the government and the bureaucracy and everything else. And there are many countries that could be great farm, farmland. Could be. Should be. But aren't. Well, I come from farming background. I know there's a lot of Dutch farmers that went to uh, Kenya and they set up big farms up there. Basically, I had just a small farm, you know, a couple hundred acres. But I don't know what it looks like to do 15,000 acres. I'm not sure I'm capable of managing that much. But. Uh, well, I couldn't even manage 200 acres, so you're ahead of <laughs> much less 15,000. But I do know a little bit about agriculture, so I'm investing in agriculture. And letting people like you do the work. Because I wouldn't be any good at it. <laughs> well, it's, it's given us a living, but it's not something that for the, the last 40 years have been that you get rich off of it. You were making my point. That's the point I'm making. It has been a terrible business for 30 years uh, for most people, and that has to change. You've left farming for a variety of reasons. Many people have and are leaving farming for the reasons you left and other people are leaving. And young people are not becoming farmers. So. Something has to change, or we're not going to have any food. And that, that's not going to happen. Yes, sir. You made the statement that you're investing in agriculture. Uh, when most people think about agricultural funds, they think about stuff we can eat, like, you know, rice, beans, corn, wheat. We're, um, we're in a little bit. Uh, different area. So, two questions. One, what areas or crops are you most keen on and in, in investing in for the future? And how do you see our project is playing into the future? Since people don't think of eating neem and coconut per se, but it does have a lot of end product uses. Well, there are lots of ways to invest in agriculture. You can go into fertilizer or uh, tractors, there are many ways, it's Just you don't have to just be a wheat farmer, for instance, to be in agriculture. Uh, there also, you can I mean, go to the agricultural areas and open restaurants. 
if you want to, because the farmers are going to be very rich in the future. Open shops, because they're going to be doing all sorts of things with their money. Get the Lamborghini dealership in Nebraska, or Oklahoma, if you want to, because they're going to have a lot more money to spend. So there are lots of ways to invest in agriculture. A, the best way is to be a farmer and grow crops or grow products yourself, because then you get a double or triple play. Um, but that's not for everybody. But which, which crop? I, gosh, I wish I knew that. Can you imagine how rich I would be if I knew the exact one crop, the exact one agricultural product that's going to be the best going forward? Uh, usually, I like to buy things that are cheap. I showed you in the chart that agriculture has not done well. Agricultural products have not done, have not done well for a long time now. So in my view, nearly all agricultural products have a great future. I wish I was smart enough to tell you the very one. As far as this particular uh, project, the, the one reason I'm here, this is astonishing uh, potential, astonishing concept. Uh, one reason I'm here is to see about the execution. You know, it's, there are lots of people who have great concepts who cannot execute. This is a phenomenal concept. And if the execution is here, it's going to be extraordinarily successful. I guess we're all going to find out in the next day or two about the execution. And certainly in the next decade or two, we're going to find out about the execution. And everything I know so far looks great. But I haven't been out and touched any trees or anything else. You, you probably know more about the execution at the moment than I do. But I do know that agriculture, unless you're a total fool, you're going to do well in agriculture. Now, I would not do well in agriculture. I told you I couldn't even run his farm, much less a big farm. But unless you're a total fool, you're going to do well in agriculture going forward. Yes, Miss. Um, I'm Mary Adams. I'm Mary? from London. Mary Adams. Mary Adams. Mary Adams. Ah, yeah. This is Mary Adams. I'm Mary Adams. Okay. Where are you from? Um, London. London. Ah. Yeah. Um, I think there's going to be. Um, an election here in Brazil shortly. Yes. And um, I'm just wondering what your thoughts will be um, as to how agriculture <coughs> will be affected by whoever gets into power. Well, as I said before, the South American politicians have been pretty hopeless for a long, long, long time. I first came here in 1973 to Brazil, not to Porto Leza, but to Brazil. And it was really badly run then. <coughs> um, the previous president, before the lady who's the president now, did a, a fairly good job in Brazil. Uh, this lady who's the president now has made many mistakes, as Brazilian politicians always do. Uh, whatever happens, and let's assume that we have a, another incompetent elected in Brazil, as usually happens. Fortunately or unfortunately, agriculture has to survive because she's got so many farmers and so much agriculture in the land that historically, agriculture has always survived in Brazil. Of course, she could do something really foolish. I mean, she could take everybody's land away. I don't think that's going to happen. It has never happened in Brazil. It has happened in some countries. But both of the ladies running now uh, seem to know enough about agriculture that they cannot destroy the agricultural community in Brazil. So I don't think that's going to happen. It could happen in other countries, but I don't think it's going to happen here. Yes, sir. Oh, well, no, he's got the mic. Go ahead. If you've got the mic, you speak. Sorry. And unless, in fact, that's the way we do it. If you'll raise your hand, uh, he will call us, we'll bring the uh, microphone around, and then we just keep going. So, your name and your country, and then... Yeah, hi. I'm uh, Tormy, and I'm from Toronto, Canada. Yes. Um, so I actually want to uh, revisit the U.S. dollar question. Jesus was talking a little bit about it and, and touched on some of my points, but my, my uh, question deals again with China more so. They've been on a resource quest throughout the world. They've circled uh, uh, Africa with ports and they're dominating the market stalls there and they've uh, called in their uh, rainforest option on Ecuador and, and things like that. Um, it's unclear to me how much uh, uh, gold they even have, despite what they're professing, it's, it's, it's clearly migrating there, so that's a hard asset class. Um, is, it, is it conceivable that they would invoke 
uh, uh, intentionally uh, a U.S. dollar class by unpegging, and or, or more likely, would they prefer a managed decline? Uh, Putin tried to call it in in 2008, and, and Russia or China declined apparently. But do you do you think that they would invoke a catastrophic event or try to manage it? We, 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 the United States, are invoking the catastrophic events because we keep spending money and running up our debt. Don't blame it on the Chinese or the rest of the world. We're the ones spending the money. Ah, well, they are one of the countries now which is looking to figure out a way to come up with a system which is not totally reliant on the U.S. dollar. But they're not doing it because they're evil and, and want to destroy the U.S. They're doing it because they want to save themselves. It's like everybody in this room, we want to save ourselves. So we got to figure out what to do when this collapse of the U.S. dollar comes. Because it is going, as I said before, no country in world history that's gotten itself into this kind of situation has gotten out without a uh, crisis or a semi-crisis. I mean, I don't, I don't, listen, I'm an American citizen. I don't like saying this, but I've got to be realistic of what's going on. The Chinese are the largest creditor of the U.S. at the moment. And that's one reason they are trying to figure out a way to save themselves. Will they at some point just say, well, aha, we're going to dump our U.S. dollars? I doubt it, uh, unless there's a war or something, because that hurts them as much as, not as much as it hurts the U.S., but it would not be to their benefit. That's why they now are trying to figure out a, 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 an alternative. Go ahead. Is the, the Bank, is that, is that That's, uh, did you all hear the question about the BRICS bank? That's part of what they're trying to find a solution, a, comp a, a new way to do things. This BRICS bank, uh, which the BRICS countries have put together, I mean, I don't have much confidence in the BRICS bank, but it's a start. It's that somebody's got to come up with a solution to this U.S. dollar problem uh, for all the reasons which I've said <coughs> before. Will it be the BRICS bank? I don't have to think so. But it could be. But everybody, not everybody, but many people now are trying to find a way to solve the problem of the U.S. dollar. Uh, at some point, yes, I said before, at some point, in my view, the dollar is going to go up a lot. But then it's going to start going down, and there's going to come a time, just as with the pound sterling, there will be a total collapse. Uh, Forty years ago, or nearly 40 years ago, Things got so bad in the UK that the UK government could not sell government bonds. Nobody but even my government bonds in the UK because things were so bad and the currency collapsed. The IMF had to come to, had to fly to London to bail out the UK. He just give me that back in case you want to talk some more. Uh, so that's what, ha that's the way these things happen. That's what happened in the UK. They just went bankrupt. And the yeah. government had to be bailed out by the IMF. And the sterling totally collapsed. And nobody would buy bonds, nobody would buy sterling. But it wasn't, wasn't as though some evil people sat around and said, aha, let's dump our sterling. It was just a horrible, horrible, horrible situation with debt, bad management, and everything else. And that's what will happen to the U.S. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll conclude only with the idea that, that something like a, a liquid opportunity seems to be an excellent way of, 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 of moving away from the U.S. dollar and, and, and moving into a, a, you know, a growing field, an agricultural field that, that, in fact, is protected and sheltered. So. Did the boss get you to say that? Uh, no, no, but... Did you but, tell him to say that? But, but why are we here, right? This no, is, I know. It's, it's, a, it's, an, I excellent, it's an excellent vehicle. The, as I said before, Agriculture has been a one, probably the main thing, as a way to survive yeah. when currencies collapse, when there's chaos and turmoil in the world. Uh, it's it's not always. I mean, maybe you need a few gold and silver coins as well, but agriculture over the long term has been the way to save yourself. You you okay? So I'll ask about the gold too. But uh, do do you have do you have an opinion between gold and silver? Are, are they you know? Silver will spike and drop, I guess, or, or is it is it just hang on to gold and... Uh... I have some silver yeah. in my pocket. You yeah. never know when you might need a little silver. <laughs> I hope I have a little gold in my pocket, too. Ah! <laughs> gold as well. 
I own gold and I own silver. I wouldn't buy either at the moment. Uh, if I had to buy one at the moment, I would buy silver, just because it's cheaper on a historic basis. I am not buying either. I expect both of them to go down some more, but uh, first of all, my market timing is usually pretty hopeless, but uh, I do own them, I'm not selling, and if they collapse or go down more, I hope I'm smart enough to buy more. <coughs> Who's got the mic? Uh, Scott from Philadelphia. Uh, it seems like in the past you, you haven't been too excited about uh, Brazil, but you, you currently are. Could you uh, expand on that and maybe talk about the real as well? Well, I didn't say I was excited about Brazil. I said that Brazil uh, is a good place to, to hide if the world comes to an end. That's, that's what I said. Uh, I know I am not excited about Brazil. I'm more excited about uh, Asia. Uh, my children are not learning Portuguese. <clears throat> if I could find some way for my little girl to learn Portuguese, I would. Living in Singapore is very, very, very difficult to <laughs> ask somebody to teach you Portuguese. If we found a Spanish teacher, I would prefer a Portuguese teacher because uh, Brazil, in my view, has a better future of Brazil and the Portuguese-speaking nations have a better future than most of the Spanish-speaking nations. So. I'm not excited about uh, Brazil, but I am certainly not anti, not negative. I mean, I, <clears throat> the, re the reality of Brazil is that it has always survived, even though it's had some pretty bad management at times in its history. Uh, the reality, I, I, don't, I don't know. I just don't have an opinion at the moment. Okay. You were here 30 years ago, and you, you didn't... You, 30, you, 40 years ago, 30 years ago, yeah, I've been here when, more than Whenever once. it was. Been here more than once, yeah. you, you've been here more than once. Um, has, it, has it changed in a, in a positive way? Oh, yeah. Brazil has changed enormously uh, since I first came here uh, in a positive way. Things have gotten better. Uh, it is not, I mean, it's not Singapore uh, by any stretch of the imagination. It's not Hong Kong. Uh, but no, it's changed enormously. If nothing else, just the, the awareness of the outside world. Forty years ago, if there was an awareness of the outside world, it was a way to you know, get your money out of Brazil on the black market and, and hide it somewhere else. But now Brazil is a much bigger tr uh, trader, an international trader. They deal with the outside much, much, much more. The Japanese and the Chinese and the Koreans do a lot of business here. Uh, 30 or 40 years ago, China, in Brazil, they didn't know where China was. They didn't care where China was. No, no, the awareness of the outside world and the interaction with the outside world has changed enormously. That's why I'm not so worried about the new lady, whoever, whichever lady <coughs> wins, that, they will, that she will destroy Brazil. She may not be good for Brazil, but they, they, they have to deal with the outside world now, and they know it. That was not the case. 40 years ago. Who's got the mic? Speak, speak, speak. Hi, I'm Tom from London. Um, Tom, you, Tom, from, Tom London. from London. Uh, you mentioned in your talk and several times since uh, developing countries that have failed to progress or improve down to bad management. I assume you're mainly talking there about government policy and, uh, and uh, kind of government in charge. Um, Thinking specifically about Brazil, what do you think are the key things that the government have got to get right for it to prosper? It clearly has natural resources in its favor. Uh, well, the main thing they need to do is uh, stop uh, subsidizing various industries and protecting the, the, la the lady, the lady is the president now. Historically, the way Brazil has worked is you have a bull market in commodities, everything is great, and they open up a lot. Then the bear market comes and they start doing crazy things. They put in protectionism. They, they subsidize various and sundry people. Things get bad. They have a military coup. And they start over again. Um, doesn't look like they're going to have a military coup this, this time. But the lady who's president now started doing all the wrong things, even though times were good. She put on tariffs and, and uh, quotas against her main part, against the Chinese and the, and the Japanese and the Koreans. I mean, these are her main trading partners. And she starts slapping them in the face, even in good times. She put on exchange controls. So mainly what she has, what she, whoever she is, needs to do, if you ask me, is to get rid of the exchange controls, get rid of all of these tariffs and uh, 
protection against big trading company, countries, because Brazil, you know what the Brazilians say about uh, Brazil, is that Brazil is the next great country in the world, and it always has been, and always will be the next great country. And they say the reason, for, and this is what the Brazilians say, I'm not, I presume there's somebody here must be Brazilian, so I'm not picking on Brazil. The Brazilians say, Brazil is God's chosen country. It's the country he loves most of all in the world. And then he sent the Brazilians to run it. And, and that's why Brazil always has the problems. Now, I don't know if God did that or not, but uh, it has been badly managed for 200 years. Uh, again, this is not my opinion. It's pretty simple to, to look it up. They could stop doing some of the foolish things that they do. But Brazil is the next great country in the world. It always has been and always will. It's not going away. It's too rich. To, as I said, they say it's God's favorite country, even though he's got his head in front of So I'm not, I'm not worried that Brazil is going to disappear and fall off the face of the earth. Ukraine might, but Brazil's not. Yes. Uh, James Duckworth from Liquid. I wondered if you could um, give your thoughts on market volatility, which seems to be multi-year lows, and yet the what world... Kind, what kind of volatility? Market volatility, market volatility. the VIX. Um, you know, geopolitically, we seem in a lot more dangerous place than we have been for a while, and yet the market seems unperturbed. Well, the market's unperturbed because for the first time in recorded history, we have all the major central banks printing huge amounts of money. It, there's a massive artificial ocean of liquidity uh, floating around. I mean, open the door, you'll see the liquidity is rising all over the world, uh, for, for better or for worse, and the people who are getting all of that money are having a wonderful time. The overall situation continues to get worse. Uh, the debts are going higher and higher. The money, money printing has never been good in the long term. For a while, it's always been good. You throw a lot of money out the window, some people get it, and they think they're better off. But the debts are going higher, the print and paper money is going up by staggering amounts, and while that lasts, everybody thinks they're better off. But it's, it's stopping now. Okay, well, there comes a time when, when eventually, uh, you say it's stopping now. The, the, the U.S. government buying bonds is stopping now. The money printing is not stopping now. Uh, the money printing is still going on everywhere in the world, and in fact, the Europeans have said recently, well, why don't we print some more too? You know, what's his name, Draghi said, I will do whatever, this is his word, whatever it takes. The Japanese have said that they will print, and they said, quote, unlimited amounts of money. The British got into the game, Americans are certainly, we're not buying, they say they're going to stop buying bonds, which means interest rates might go up, but they can still print, and that's going on. Eventually, one of two things is going to happen. Either they're going to come to their senses, very, very unlikely. These people are all academics and bureaucrats, or the market's just going to say, we're not going to take it anymore. We don't want this garbage paper anymore. That's already starting to happen in some countries. You know, some currencies just market, or some currencies are collapsing. Uh, and that's why I am, why I own, not often, why I own the U.S. dollar, because I can see more currency turmoil coming in other countries, and rightly or wrongly, people will see <coughs> the U.S. dollar. It's a terribly flawed currency, and it's going to be, most markets, things get too expensive, it will probably go up too much in the turmoil, uh, and I hope I'm smart enough to do something. What? I wish I knew. Maybe I will buy coconuts. I, I don't know. Yes, miss. Kelly from Switzerland. Kelly from where? Switzerland. Okay. Already. Where in Switzerland? Basel. Basel, oh. Already going back 10 years, 15 years, you had people who are recommending investing in agriculture. And yet you can see from your chart that it's still been pretty flat. What makes the timing of it different now? as far as as an investment? Well, I want to tell you that I am uh, the world's worst market timer. I'm the world's worst trader. <laughs> there is nobody worse than me at getting timing right. 
but I will say to you that I <coughs> suspect, uh, and remember that I'm the world's worst at this, that this year will probably be a bottom. We will hit because we've had good crops. Uh, and so prices are coming down. We're probably having a crescendo of selling. And I would suspect that this year will be the bottom for agriculture and that things will then go higher and higher and higher. But Kelly, I'm the world's worst market time. But in my view, this year will be, next time I look at, we look at that chart 10 years from now, agriculture will be going, have gone up quite a lot over the decade. It has been down for 16 years. It's been terrible for 30 years. I don't have a 30-year chart, I'll show you that. So in my view, this is, we are in the process of making the bottom. But don't listen to me. Please don't listen to me. Watch CNBC. Even CNBC is better than I am. As bad as they are, and they are useless, but I'm worse. I'm worse. Who's got the... I got... Seats. Walt, Walt DeLang, back again. Okay, well, How, just, just, just not to be rude. Uh, is there somebody who hasn't asked a question who would like to... Well, do you mind because you've had a time question. Uh, if we have time, I'll come back. Uh, I'm Andrew from Colorado. Um, I was just... You talked a lot about buying agricultural land, uh, becoming a farmer. Uh, would there be a maybe a way with less risk, uh, just investing in, say, the companies that uh, maybe the, the agriculture, or the, uh, like John Deere, ConAgra, Monsanto. Yes, yes, yes. yes, I said before, there are many ways to do it. You can invest in tractor companies. You can invest in fertilizer companies, seed companies. There are many ways to do it. Uh, banks that are in the, in the agricultural area, Yes, 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 yes. That is a good way to do it. If you don't want to become a farmer yourself, if you don't want to <coughs> buy land, there are many, many ways. Uh, do you have a job? Are you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What, is, what kind of? Uh, well, I would actually like to work outside. I uh, work in an office building in front of a computer screen all day. See? So. <laughs> well, become a farmer. You know how to drive a tractor? I could learn quickly. <laughs> do you speak Portuguese? Maybe we'll hire this guy. You know? Where's there's the boss? You know, speak to him. Yeah. Maybe you can work outside. Yeah. Well, I I do want to work. Uh, there's a agricultural bank in uh, Colorado, and I'd love to work for them. So then go you know, go so. go work for them. Or come come to Brazil. I mean, my God, the women in Brazil are astonishing. <laughs> of course, the, the women in Colorado are astonishing too. Uh, it's it's strange, you know. Everywhere I go, the women are astonishing. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> You know, no matter where I go, I see astonishing women. But no, come to Brazil. You need a, you know how to pick coconuts? <laughs> you can learn. It's where you, it's good outside work. But back to the point, yes, there are many, many ways to invest in agriculture going forward. John Deere may be one of them. Go ahead. I think we have one more question. Is it time to say, if it tell, if it, listen, I'm happy to sit down. Tell me, okay, this is the last question. Hi, my name's Fred from Louisiana. I'm just curious what your opinion is of the housing market in the U.S. Uh, well, the, the problem with that question is where? Iowa, I would be much more optimistic about housing in Iowa than I would in New York or Boston. New York and Boston are financial uh, cities. Uh, Iowa is, you know, the farm area. So it really depends on where. And the U.S. is a huge country, gigantic, one of the geographically one of the five largest in the world. So it's where. Uh, if you want to buy housing in the U.S., I would make sure it's in an agricultural area, not in a financial area. Going forward, where do you live in Louisiana? Baton Rouge. Uh, well, it's a government town. <coughs> government towns usually are fairly stable. Then may change when we finally run out of money, uh, when the governments run out of money. But uh, think about going over to Arkansas or Mississippi or even some of the agricultural parts of, of Louisiana. Sugar, you could go, go where the sugar farms are in Louisiana and maybe you'll get rich. So thank you all very much.